Hey everybody, this is Brother Frank, and welcome to another episode of The Remnant Call. Times are changing. Things are moving rapidly, and folks, you are living in the last days. I know you've heard about it. Your grandparents probably told you about it. Your parents may have told you about it. But folks, welcome to the end times. We are officially there. You don't have to wait any longer. This is the moment, the hour, the days that you have been hearing about and looking forward to the soon coming of our Lord and Savior. But before that, things are going to get radical. And there's nobody, I don't think, around Harley that understands that better right now in this hour than Brother Benjamin Brook. And so with that, I'm going to bring on Benjamin here with me this evening. Brother, are you there? Yeah, shalom, Frank. I'm uh, here. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Brother, I appreciate this. This is, uh, you know, this is year 20, let's see, 1999 to 2024. This is 20, you know, five to six right in their years. You and I have known each other. And brother, you started this before we ever knew each other. And we are here. We're here. There's, we are here. yeah. So yeah. we don't have to wait anymore, folks. This is, you're no. here. Welcome. You know, isn't, Frank, isn't it amazing? You know, the, um, the book that the Lord had me type for him, the day of the Lord is at hand. Amen. It it was, it, it actually got, it, it started, the work started right after Passover um, in 1998. And, and the text, the rough draft of the text was finished by Pentecost. And over the course of the summer, uh, the typesetting and the ed final edit review and the, and the final polishing of uh, all of as many of the fingerprints of man that could be erased from the text. We, I, we removed them by prayer and by the guiding of the Holy Spirit. And, and Frank, the book was actually published on the eve of Yom Kippur. The sun was going down and um, it was going to be Yom Kippur in about an hour. And I was getting ready to jump in the car and drive to the publishing company. And we were going to set the print number. And the Lord had told me that I will furnish everything for this work. You will do nothing. I will provide everything, including all of the funds. And, and then somebody had given me $5,000 to start the process when I began the work. And we had spent most of it with the typeset and that was in the old school before we had this print on demand technology. And I think I had enough money left to publish maybe 500 books and I'm getting ready to walk out the door. And, and Frank, I, I lifted up my, my wrist, you know, I had a watch on at the time and I lifted up my wrist and I, I was pointing to my watch and I said, Lord, I know, you know what time it is, but Lord, I'm about to walk out the door and, and I'm going to push the button on the print run. And right now, I don't have the money to print more than just a few hundred copies of this book. And if that's all you want, that's fine. But if you want to print more than that, Lord, you're going to need to move like right. And before I can even finish my sentence, the phone's ringing. Frank, I pick up the phone and it's this Dr. Ron friend of mine who had read the manuscript. It touched him powerfully. He'd given me the original $5,000 to start the process. And Dr. Ron's on the phone and he's like, I can't get your book out of my mind. It's driving me crazy. I'm coming over tonight. I'm going to give you a blank check. You fill in whatever number God tells you to do. I want to get this work done. <laughs> I'm like, mm. I, I didn't even finish asking. Boom. Amen. Amen. Uh, and, and Dr. Ron, who's a very, very wealthy man, literally handed me a blank check and said, you pray about what to fill in. And I, I did. And the Lord said 7,000. And so I did. I filled 7,000. And that was enough money to print 5,000 copies of the book. And so so it began. And um, the book was submitted for uh, publication uh, on the eve of Yom Kippur. And, and here we are. And Frank, this what, coming- What was Yom the date? of? I mean, so there was, that was 99, though, right? Oh, no. Yeah, it was, no, it was 98. Let me, here, 98? I'll okay. I actually- Happened to have. I it got was it September in September of 1998, and it was literally on 
you know, I started the work in the spring, uh, right after the Passover and, uh, finished it and, and we pushed the print run, you know, an hour before Yom Kippur. And, you know, what's amazing is, uh, the, the intro to the book says 2000 years ago, the Messiah came and literally that's about the extent of it. This was the 2000 years later, the Lord was now going to commission a work to come forth. And, you know, if the, the listeners haven't read the day of the Lord, you know, maybe you want to, maybe you don't. It's, um, you know, a lot of people got blessed by it, but really the books that if people have not read the search, the scriptures series, and Frank, I am going to try to finish volumes five, six, and seven mm. in the next 90 days. Amen. Uh, folks, this is all, I want to mention one thing about the day of the Lord, because it's important. This, this book is, it, you know, there's it, Psalm 12, six. It's the, it remind it's that's 12, six. It's seven times. There were seven revisions, right? Yeah. There, of that book. That's correct. You know, if you've ever folks, you should read Psalm 12, six sometime. And I'll let you read that on the own. And uh, that's exactly how many times, that book was revised and Benjamin added some updates and things like that just to, but time marched on. Yeah. You know, and some of the, some of the, um, the, the Russian troll critics that have, you know, wrote attacking comments on, on the reviews on Amazon, you know, basically said, you know, this author had to revise this book, you know, seven times, you know, cause he kept, he kept being wrong. And well, you know, I kept trying to discern the timing of this judgment. That's true. And, and and it was a puzzle that I gradually unpacked. And the book got revised because in 2001, the world changed. And, you know, and and again, in, you know, as we move through time in 2008, the world changed. In 2012, the world changed again. And mm -hmm. so I kept updating the book for more revelation from Scripture and for also the, the evolving events of the end of the age. You know, but which the book never changed itself from the original because of what the message was. It was editions, folks. I can tell you that all, all I can tell you is this that was printed in 1998. Someone handed that book to me in the beginning of 1999. And about a, about a couple weeks later, after I read, started reading that book, a man who had barely made it out of school that was me. I had only read a few books in my entire life because I was made to. And here someone slaps 300 and how many pages down in front of me full of the scripture. And I'm like, what? I couldn't put it down. And all I can tell you is I left in March, 1999 strung out on meth. My wife, my family, everything was over. I was as far gone as a man could be. And I got born again outside of a church with no knowledge about how to be saved. And I met the Lord directly in my vehicle and got delivered while driving down the road. I don't, you, there is no possible way that could ever happen without divine intervention that a man could be in my state and get born again without knowing how to get saved outside of a church. And the Lord radically changed my life around. Well, One yeah. day. I left and I got born again. I was clean for the rest of my life. Yeah, the Lord did the book. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, geez, I only typed it. And honestly, I sat at the computer and somebody suggested I should maybe pray about writing a book. And I thought, I've never done that before. And I prayed about it. And the Lord said, yes, I want you to write a book. And so I sat down on my computer. I said, Lord, I don't, I don't even know where to begin. I don't even have a title. I looked down and my Bible was open to Isaiah 13. And I looked at verse six, the day of the Lord is at hand. And and you know what, brother? <laughs> uh, we've come full circle because it is indeed now upon us. And, you know, if people haven't read the book, there is one part of the book that changed. I attempted to reason through the timing of the judgment because there's a challenge. You know, there was a scriptural challenge in Jeremiah and I'll, I'll read it to you. It's it's actually repeated. It's in Jeremiah 49. Um, and, and it again is in uh, Jeremiah 50. And, and it's a challenge text, you know, for the, you prophetic students. You know, the, the text reads, and who will appoint me the time? Who, who's going to discern the timing of the judgment of America? Well, 
you know, I, I'm always up for a good challenge. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try to discern this in the context of the prophecies of the, the 70 weeks prophecy and the prophecy of the fall of Babylon and, and so on and so forth. So in every revision to the book, I had a took another peel off that onion, if you will. But, you know, the, I knew there was a missing jubilee because the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, speaks of that there were would be 77s determined upon the people of Israel and the holy city. And I'll read the exact text. 77s are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to bring an end of transgression, to make an end of sin, to bring in reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. Hallelujah. That's what's ahead for us who are in the remnant. And to seal a vision in prophecy and to anoint the most holy. And in Hebrew, it's Kadosh Kadashim, the holiest of the holy places. And we know when Yeshua came 2,000 years ago, after the 62 weeks, he was the holy place. And he became anointed with the spirit without measure. And there will be another anointing soon. But, you know, in, in reasoning through, I, I understand the prophecies because I'm a Hebrew. And so I, I think like an Israeli, right? And I realize we use a different calendar than the Goy. You know, we, we have a calendar that repeats itself every eight years perfectly. And we have leap years with the month of Adar being duplicated. We have two Adars in a leap year and and I, I also understand that every seven years is a Sabbath year. And after seven Sabbath years, we have a Jubilee, which is the 50th year. Even as the Feast of Weeks, which is the celebration of Shavuot, which the Gentiles call Pentecost, occurs after 49 days of counting from the Feast of First Fruit. And the Feast of Seven Weeks is the feast day to celebrate the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 9. And and it's all about the 50th year. The sevens point to Shabbat. The seven sevens point to Jubilee. And so I knew that the Jubilee was the key to the prophecy. And now Isaac Newton in his book discerned the same thing. I, now, Newton was smarter than all of us combined for sure. But, you know, did God reveal this to him or did Newton just see it himself from his brilliance? I have no idea. The Lord showed me. I, I wasn't that smart. But the Lord showed me that these Jubilee years were the key. And in within the 62 weeks from the command of Artaxerxes to the birth of Yeshua in 2 BC were, were 62 weeks. Well, that's 434 years. The commandment was in 444 BC. Yeshua was born in 2 BC. That's 442 years. How does 434 turn into 442? Well, you got to add eight. Gee, what is eight number of anyway? New beginnings. And eight Jubilees are the compass of time within 400 years. We would have eight jubilees. And then again, the seven sevens at the end of the age, which is a period of 49 years. Again, there, you would add the jubilee. It's a metric of measurement unto the jubilee, which is the day of his redeemed. The, the totality of our salvation and redemption is all revealed and manifest in these jubilee years. Hallelujah. So within this prophecy, there's eight and one. Well, you know, that adds up to nine. Yet, 77s is 490 years. That's 10 Jubilee cycles. Well, where's the 10th Jubilee? I knew there was a missing Jubilee. I just didn't understand where it was or which one it was. I had no idea that in the prophecy of Daniel, the 77s that were decreed upon the people of Israel were themselves seven Sabbath years. And 70 of those series of Sabbaths, which means 70 Jubilees. And nobody, well, to my knowledge, I've never heard anyone else teach about the second part of the hidden prophecy of Daniel 9, in which there are actually 70 Jubilees decreed upon the people of Israel. Well, that's like mind-blowing. That You start that from the Exodus. And Jesus was born on a Jubilee in 2 BC. Adam was created in 4002 BC. Jesus was born on the 4,000th day or year, if you will, of creation. And 4,000 years is 80 jubilees. 80 is the number of the new beginning, 8 being completed, 10. 
And so God completed the new creation when the Son of God himself took on the humility of our humanity and was born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem. And so Israel itself was redeemed at the end of the age in 1948, 1949. And Yeshua's birth is on the Jubilee cycle. Israel's rebirth following the War of Independence is a, is a Jubilee cycle. If you go back to 4002 BC for the creation of Adam, then 1999 was the 120th Jubilee of creation. And you go from 2 BC, the next Jubilee is the year 49 because there is no year zero. So 2 and 49 is 51, but you subtract because there is no year zero. So it's 50 years. And so here we are. 1999 was the 69th Jubilee of Israel and the 120th Jubilee of creation. And the Father God Almighty declared, the Lord declared unto Noah, I will not always strive with man. For after 120 years, the end of all flesh would come. And in Noah's day, that prophecy was, was fulfilled after 120 years. And in our time, in, in, the, in the span of creation, those 120 years are jubilee years. And they represent the 6,000 years that God would strive with man. And after 120 jubilees, the end of all flesh would come. Well, that was 1999. Well, wait a minute. Where's the end of all flesh? Well, there's one final jubilee for Israel. Because, you know, if you count the jubilees from the Exodus, which was 1452. Now, I understand the experts are don't agree on anything. Okay. I just came to bear witness of the truth. Yeshua was born on a jubilee. He is our redeemer. He is the new creation. Hallelujah. The new Adam had come. The God-man had come. The man who himself is the very son of God from eternity, having no beginning, dwelling always with the Father. This is our Lord who died for us. His blood. It's the testament of the covenant that was made by Father God with all of his elect. Amen. And it is sealed. It was nailed to the cross. And our old nature was nailed there with him. And we are as secure in this covenant as those nails were. that literally bound our Lord to that cross in death. But so here we are. The year 2024. The Spirit of God reveals to me, this is the final jubilee. The 70th jubilee of Israel. Now, the Jubilee cycle was civil, and every 50 years. This Jubilee is spiritual. If God were to wait 50 years, you know, the, the end of the age would be, you know, the coming of the man-child would be in 2049. Well, we're not going to wait 25 more years for World War III, you guys, or for the complete financial collapse of the bankrupt Western, you know, welfare states. These things have come upon us now. So how is it that God could have a spiritual jubilee? Well, how does God have a spiritual year? It starts in Nisan. He's got a civil calendar that's in Rosh Hashanah. This year, Frank, there was an eclipse that sealed the fate of America on April 8th. And that evening, Nisan 1, New Year's Day began in the spirit. That being the very 70th jubilee that began. Now, the civil jubilee begins in the fall, in either on Yom Kippur, which is what some teach, or on Rosh Hashanah. Well, this year, the final 70th jubilee, the jubilee in which God sevens, which is perfection, and he tends, he completes, 70 being the absolute perfect completion of his work in the earth. And what is that work that he's been doing? To bring forth the redemption of a righteous, holy people, totally redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, who can now overcome the dragon, the world, and their own flesh, by the power of the Holy One who lives within them, having been through the wilderness of pain, having learned the same lessons we've all learned. Our ways are grievous. Our inventions are disaster. Every other way leads to ruin. There is only one path that leads to life. There's only one road that is blessed. 
there's only one way that will prosper you in your soul, and that's Yahweh's way. That's the way of Yeshua. That's the straight and the narrow path where only the remnant, where only the elect will pass through because the proud need not apply. And the compromise, those who, who dwell with the harlots of Babylon, you can't walk on this narrow way. You have to turn your back on everything of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And in your hearts, you have to set your spiritual eyes on Zion, which, whereunto is our high calling, where the Lord is calling us home, and he's calling us to his throne. And so here we are in this 70th Jubilee. Who even knows this, right? I mean, I, I've told people they don't even believe me. It's like, okay, you know, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting the one who sent me. I'm not going to take it personal. You know, God told Samuel, what are you upset about? They're not rejecting your word. You're speaking my word. It is me that the people have rejected, not you. But for those who can receive it, the 70th Jubilee is coming. Frank, what's so amazing, we had that incredible eclipse that was the Aleph Tav, and it was literally God putting the X, like, you know, a condemned building following the Hurricane Katrina. They put the X on the side. They paint the X on the side of the buildings with a circle, you know. The building's condemned. Don't even enter again. This building is going to be torn down. It's going to be destroyed. It's no longer fit for any purpose. So God also put the X over America. And now, this is amazing. We have a second eclipse coming. On what day? Rosh Hashanah. Oh, another New Year Day eclipse. One for the high holy days of the, of the spiritual calendar. Inaugurating Passover, the Feast of First Fruit, leading us into the time of visitation in Shavuot. And now again an eclipse on Rosh Hashanah, this one over the Pacific. Frank, it, the darkness covers Easter Island. And I didn't know barely that. touches Ch Chile and Argentina. It's over the Pacific. And, and what does the Pacific represent? The word means peace. It's the sea of peace. And the sea represents humanity. So the Pacific represents the peace that humanity has known. By God's mercy and grace, peace has prevailed upon the earth. I mean, yes, there have been wars in here and there. I, but for the most part, those of us who live in the United States of America, we have not seen any wars in our neighborhoods to speak of, a few incidents. But I'm talking about World War II, where the entire cities were leveled, entire nations were destroyed, where there were 20 million civilians killed, like the war that's being fought in Gaza right now, or the war that is in Ukraine, the war that's in all likelihood coming to North Korea, the war that is soon to come on our shores. Here God is giving these final warnings unto us but yeah back to the book the the criticism is correct benjamin didn't know everything in 1998 that god revealed to him in the next 26 years yeah <laughs> i mean for sure the lord has continued to reveal more and more and more and that's why the book got updated and yes i kept wrestling with the prophecy of jeremiah 50 verse 44, behold, he shall come up like a lion. Okay, that's the Antichrist coming up as a lion. You know, the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. The lion has emerged from the thicket. He's already attacking you through your food, through the air, bioweapons. We're being attacked in ways we don't even see. The enemy has come. He's risen up out of the thicket. And he's going to come upon the West from the swelling of the Jordan. That's the crisis in the Middle East, which is only going to explode. The peace process is dead. I studied Israeli political science in Jerusalem. I'm a former military analyst. I'm a specialist in the Middle East. And I've been to the... I look, I lived in Jerusalem. I trained with IDF Special Forces. New friends in Israeli intelligence. I have studied this since the early 1970s. I know something about my own country. And I understand the military, economic, political balance of power. And if you just look at reality, 
The United States is bankrupting itself. The American population is, the younger people are turning decidedly against Israel. And they're embracing Hamas, which means violence. They're, they're embracing Iran that shouts death through America. American college students are cheering for death for their own families, death in their own lives. And the Lord's word is eternally set, established in heaven. I will bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. And so the younger generation of this nation, many of them are engaging in the very actions that will bring forth the final curse under their lives. And they have no idea. Israel is facing a war that cannot be avoided. What are they going to negotiate with Iran? Are you serious? Negotiate with Hamas? Negotiate with Hezbollah? No, no, negotiate with the PA? The Palestinians voted Hamas into power. No, the covenant of death has been annulled. The peace process is over. Bibi Netanyahu said so much to the whole earth, quoting Ecclesiastes. There's a time for peace, but now is a time for war. And this war is not going to stop. This is actually the war of Ezekiel 38. And, and we're in the early phases. As the Antichrist will come forth from the swelling of the Jordan. That's the crisis in the Middle East, which is happening right now. Unto the habitation of the strong. Land of the free, proud of the brave. Yeah, number one. Huh. Yeah, number one on God's list for judgment next. But I, the Lord, will make the enemies suddenly run away from America. Hallelujah. And who is the chosen one that I may appoint over her? You guys, we're going to get a new government. Hallelujah. Following the war, the Lord's going to appoint a new governor over what's left of America. And guess what? It's going to be a democratic election. There's one vote, the Lord. And whoever he votes for, that's who wins. And you're going to really like the new government because they're going to be following the absolute direction of the Lord. Righteousness will be restored once the land is burned. And who is the chosen one that may appoint over? And who is like me? Our new governor is going to have the heart of the Lord. He's going to be like King David. His whole concern will be the people. He'll be a shepherd. Finally, there'll be a shepherd over what's left of this nation. And who will appoint me the time? Well, there's your challenge. Discern the time. See if you can figure it out. <laughs> when is when's the judgment of America going to occur? That's a pretty tough prophetic challenge. You have to be able to see through the 70 years of American Babylon, which are the, the second fulfillment of the prophecies of Jeremiah 25, 12. Then you have to discern, well, when did the 70 years start? When do they end? Okay, well, 1950, NATO, boom. We're the leader of the free world. The sudden lone superpower. And when did they end? 2020. Well, did anything change in 2020? <laughs> no, no. Go back to sleep. Nothing changed. But, but why wasn't Babylon judged? Well, why do you think it wasn't judged? Do you understand the number of people that have died? The excess, excess deaths? The turbo cancers? The number of babies that are dying? Sudden infant death syndrome, Benjamin. Don't you know babies just die? I mean, that's just what they do. In ever-increasing numbers. Right. I mean, it's from the 5G towers, I'm sure. No, of course not. That's from all the poisons. The breath of the dragon. Poisoning everything in our world. Who will appoint the time? And who is that shepherd that will stand before me? Well, I took that up as a prophetic challenge, right? Hey, you know, it's like a puzzle. You know, the Lord's asking a question, you know, figure it out. But how could you figure it out? You know, you, well, start, you know, you start with Psalm 90, 70 years by strength, 80. Okay, where do you benchmark from? 48? No, it's the rule of Babylon. It's not the rebirth of Israel. Well, who's Babylon? Well, America, if you can discern it. When did she become a superpower? And then... You know, if you look closer, 
the birth of the man child is what's prophesied by the seven weeks prophecy of Daniel 9. The Messiah shall come after seven sevens, which is 49 years. Add that Jubilee. You got 50. We're not talking about in the clouds, folks. I'm not telling you the day or the hour. I'm talking about the appearance of the man child. 144,000 who will come forth out of the fires of this great final war that's about to be fought. But the seven sevens have been fulfilled. Where is the man child? What are we missing? The missing Jubilee. Because he comes in visitation in a Jubilee. Well, where's the missing Jubilee? How do we figure out the Jubilee? Well, until you realize that there's a prophecy regarding the people of Israel, and that it itself is a prophecy of 70 Jubilees, and the final 70 Jubilee is the missing 10th Jubilee of Daniel's prophecy. It's the completion of Daniel's prophecy. Well, when could that be? Well, good luck guessing that one, right? Unless the Lord tells you the answer, how would you know? Yet here we are. You know, and Yeshua stood up. You know, bless the Lord. Everything he did was so perfect. I, I just, you know, I... Just rejoice to know that what we're about to witness is the fulfillment of his ministry. When Yeshua stood up in Nazareth announcing the beginning of his ministry, he declared, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open the prison door to all that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he stopped reading and he rolled up the scroll and he never read the second half of verse two and to declare the day of vengeance of our God. And that would await the final Jubilee. If Yeshua was here today and he were to read from the scroll, he would declare unto us and to declare the favorable year, the year, the final jubilee, the 70th jubilee, the spiritual jubilee, when God is going to perfect the work he's been doing, the work that he's been doing in all of us, those who have the courage to not hide from the truth, those who have the courage to search their own hearts, those who have the love to turn away from the the grievous things of Babylon and to seek the kingdom first and that and, and not seek another. Turn your heart all the way back to the Lord. For you, it's the favorable year. This is the year when the Lord is going to show mercy. Mercy. It's the year when he wants us to come home. But Yeshua this time would read, and the day of vengeance of our God. And hallelujah, we're there. Now, one last thing, you guys. If you have not read, search the scriptures, okay? I don't know what you're thinking. Go read the reviews for Out of the Darkness. And listen, you guys, this is not an advertisement so Benjamin can make a $2.50 royalty or a $4, whatever the royalty is. This is so you can get these books into the hands of your family and your friends and people can get set free, okay? And these books are alive. The Lord did the Search the Scriptures series. I remember when he told me, I want you to publish a series of books and I want them called Search the Scriptures. And I want volume one to be entitled Out of the Darkness. And the first chapter is Matters of the Heart. And I will fashion this work as a pillar of righteousness, which I'm going to throw from the heavens to crush the head of Satan in the lives of my people. Well, would you like Satan's head crushed in your life? Then why don't you get one of these pillars and read it carefully. Read it prayerfully. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you and then pass it on to your friends because we have got to get ready. Hallelujah. Frank, should we start the message? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> folks, I, I, I've told people before, um, all you got to do is get out of the darkness, sit down and read the first chapter. And if I'm telling you right now, you will wish you had put your seatbelt on for that chapter. Right. Because it, it, go go ahead. Ahead. no, no, it, it, it's uh, it, it's shocking. It's intense. Uh, the whole book's intense, but I'm just saying I've 
rarely is a book ever started off in you know at top speed and um that book start you know it starts out at, at maximum velocity and it doesn't let off folks it is a game changing book and like benjamin said he doesn't if if you think that he's selling books to make money brother have you actually even ever broken even hardly from what you've done out of no. your own pocket no no, no. he doesn't so do this to make royalty it's ridiculous he's self published he makes like 2 bucks a something it's and if you know anything about benjamin he'll give you he gives stuff away and anyway so folks this is important the word of God obviously is the most important thing, but these books are something that are so wonderful to pass to somebody else. My dad absolutely loves Benjamin's books, right? Sends me questions. He, I, I read this out of Benjamin. What's your thought? You know what I mean? That's what my dad always doing, but you can hand it to somebody. It's easy to read, but extremely. And you know where those books will lead you to? They will lead you right back into the word. And that is, is what anybody who's sharing the Lord should be leading you back to his word. Brother, go ahead. Well, yeah. You know, when I first read Out of the Darkness, I mean, I typed it, okay? And these these were messages, the first chapter, Matters of the Heart. You can find it on, on YouTube if you search around. But you know what? There's so much truth in these messages that if you're listening to the message in audio, you don't have time to think. That's the reason the Lord had this transcribed. I mean, you know, Jeremiah prophesied these words to Israel, and we forget 80% of what we hear. It goes in one ear and out the other. That's just how we are. We only remember a small percent of what we've heard. But when it's been written down, when the Lord with his finger writes it into the stone, or when he takes his finger and his fire and he puts it, he cuts it into your stony heart, you can stop and reflect and let those words minister in power to you. Brother, what, you know, I typed these. I mean, look, the messages came forth by the anointing. Matters of the heart. I didn't even have any notes for that message, hardly. Three hours later, blown away. When I read that book, Frank, I couldn't stop weeping. And honestly, I probably read Out of the Darkness four or five times. I need to read it again. I mean, it's more powerful every time you read it. Amen. Amen. Look, we got to break through, you guys. I mean, the judgment is about to be released, okay? If you're not in the secret hiding place of the Most High God, when that door gets sealed, if you're still standing in the outer court, you know, which is about to be trodden under by the Gentiles and burned to the ground, you're going to get burned with it. Now, I'm... I'm not suggesting you're going to lose your salvation. No, no, no. Believe me, the Lord's going to cleanse you from all your sin and that fire you're going to go through. Now, a lot of you are going to think you went to hell for a day or two. <laughs> well, you kind of did, actually. You're going to go through hell on the way to heaven to burn all this idolatry out of us that you know we all, this is the great falling away. This apostasy affected everybody. God burned me in the fire. I can't even tell you how many times. And the last time he burned me for four and a half straight years, my life was in flames. And I am so grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. He set me free. And I'm walking now. I got nothing of Babylon in my heart. And Babylon's got nothing on me. And all I see it's the light of God's truth, and that's all I want. I have nothing else in my life that I desire. And you know what? That's what it takes to walk in the fullness of the anointing so that you are abiding in the dwelling place of the Most High. Look, I know a lot of believers. I was one of them for years where I could pray, and the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon me and enter the presence of the Holy One. I could hear the Lord even. Hallelujah. The Lord's with us even now. Bless you, Jesus. Thank you for helping with this program tonight. But you know, then after I would finish praying, the anointing would just kind of leak out. You know what I'm talking about? Because there were little cracks. There were little broken places in my soul. 
that weren't all healed up. They weren't all sealed up. And listen, we're going to do some more teaching on how to, how to heal and seal the broken parts of our hearts. The Lord's been having me do a ton of work. And there's more coming that's going to really equip you guys. But, you know, the, the end result is we've got to get to the place where we enter into the anointing and the anointing does not leak out of us. Where you're walking around the whole day and the presence can feel the fullness of the Spirit of God in you. And let me tell you, it's, it's, it's a better way to live. Because, you know, the, the, the alternative is that you go back into the Adamic nature. You go back into the mind of the flesh. You, you go back into that. You go back to the mountain of Horeb where Israel just kind of wandered around for 40 years. They went nowhere. And we get the word horrible from Horeb. Horeb is a place of desolation. And that's all the works of the flesh are going to do for you. Everything you accomplish through the power of the flesh is wood, hair, stubble. It profits you nothing spiritually. It profits you nothing for eternity. You know, and I, I remember the, the little girl down in, I think it was Columbia, who she was saved. Her parents had beaten her savagely as a small baby and had thrown her in a garbage dump. She, she was in a dumpster. And some Christians that ran an orphanage heard a baby crying and they pulled little Mia out. And then she was actually brain damaged from the beatings this small child endured you know at the age of five you know she didn't really have much of a vocabulary i think you know more cookie please was probably the one of the few sentences that she one more cookie please that she mastered and one day though she woke up and she was agitated and and she was trying to talk to the to the people that were her family in this orphanage and and finally she got out, Jesus, Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Everything burn. Cars, people, houses. Jesus, say, say it. Say it. And like, Mia, say what? Jesus, say, say it, that Jesus, come. Everything will burn. The people, all their wood houses, all their graven images, all of their idols. All of everything that they've done, this entire nation will burn. Jesus is coming soon. And only a remnant is going to walk through the fires like the three boys in, in ancient Babylon. And the flames did not harm them at all. Because they were walking with the Holy One. And he is going to protect that which is his. Now, if you are born again and you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, then your spirit is the Lord's. And he will protect your spirit. But if your flesh is still bound up with the sin of Babylon, if you're still walking in deception, lying to yourself, lying to your, your, your wife, lying to your, your neighbors, if you're still walking in disobedience and you're looking at pornography, you're still smoking marijuana, you're still getting drunk, you're, you're bound in the flesh, you're not walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, you know, you, you got a brief window of time to get ready and get cleaned up. Or the Lord is going to do the job for you. If you don't do this job, if you belong to him, he's going to do it. He promised he would clean you. And not, you know, I use the analogy, having been to the, what I call repentance rehabilitation workshop, which are the concentration camps of the beast government, in which the Lord cleans his people with a blowtorch and an iron brush. And you will be clean. It won't even take more than a few days. And you'll repent of everything. But you know what? Why not just do that now? Why take your children to the death camps with you? Because you don't want to repent? You know, when I went on national tour break, I, I asked the people, I said, you know, do we, do we have any mothers? In the audience, are there any, any mothers, any grandmothers here that have got grandbabies? You know, would you be willing to fast and pray for your children? Mm. Do Christian mothers still love their children? Mm. Do Christian grandmothers love their grandbabies enough 
to do whatever it takes to find the Lord in this hour. Turn off the television. It's programming you. It's syncopating your alpha waves. It's putting you in a state of mesmerization. Turn it off. Shoot the TV. Take it outside. It'll be a mess if you shoot it. But, you know, throw it away. Throw, turn off the entertainment of Babylon. Get the, the Lee's, L-I-Z-E, Hadassah music or some other very anointed worship. And, you know, fill your house with worship. Fill your time with the word of God. Fill your life with the living reality, the living presence of the Almighty God. Seek the Lord with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and God will know. He sees those things very clearly. He'll know. He will come. But if you keep playing this part-time commitment game, if you still love some of this stuff out there in Babylon, then get these books. Call a solemn assembly. Begin the discipline of fasting and praying. Amen. And seek the Lord with all your might because your life depend on it. And you know what? After I would ask if there's any mothers, I would then, I would then ask the audience. You know, are there any fathers listening to me tonight? Any grandfathers? Are there any men of God who can hear my voice? Are you willing to fast and pray for your children? For your grandchildren, for your wife, for your own life? Or do you just, you just love that cheeseburger from 